is some component of depression that can happen when they're thinking about their disease, when they're thinking about some of the losses that they experience from their disease, when they feel like they can't do all of the things that their peers can do. You don't know how, how, um, how crazy this disease is until you have it and go through it and meet people like, oh, you're not the only one. One of my friends, my best friends, we've been friends since high school. Um, we lost touch a few years ago for at least 10 years. And I just seen, I just, um, seen him at a dentist, dentist appointment. And well, I didn't see him, of course, but his mom seen me and I heard her voice. I'm like, Miss Ann, she's like, yeah, I'm like, where's Josh at? She's like, he's back there. And I'm um, like, my dude, it's crazy because he can't hear or talk. He has vision but he can't hear or talk. Like, it got to me. It, like, I didn't do nothing there, but when, as soon as I got home, I cried. So, was, I don't know, I just look at the average person and I'm like, man, they're so spoiled. They don't understand how good they have it, you know? But at the same time, I don't treat them differently because they don't know any better. Seeing them uh, laying in the incubator, uh, I didn't know what to do getting phone calls in college, you know, saying, hey, we're rushing ourselves to the hospital. Um, you know, he's just fussing all night, you know, won't stop crying. To his first visit with me alone in college, uh, he was about four. And, you know, just seeing him ball up all night long and cry and moan and not be able to tell me what's wrong with him. Uh, it really frustrated me because here I am, you know, I gotta go to practice, but I got my little guy here, you know, over the summer spending time with me and he's up all night. So having to go rush to the Children's Hospital here in Columbus, Ohio at the time was, was like really hard for me because I knew that it was something that it was life-threatening for my son, you know, at that point. Sickle cell is about so much more than pain. There's so many complications of sickle cell disease. There's over 60 complications described in all 12 organ systems. And being able to take care of sickle cell disease is really providing kind of comprehensive systemic care. Um, we at the program um, coordinate with nephrologists, cardiologists, pulmonologists, orthopedists, and that was just last week um, and um, in taking care of our patients. The emotional impact of sickle cell disease is almost as severe and constant as the physical aspect for me. Um, there is no decision that I make where I'm not thinking about if I'm going to get sick. There is no school assignment that I'm not worrying about. Will I be sick during the deadline? Will I get sick right before it's due? There's no trip that I can plan without thinking, okay, what hospitals do I look at? Um, do I need to tell my doctor if I'm going for a long time? It's those choices and actions that you have to think about. What are my family's medical bills going to look like this year? What is it going to be like if my dad has to take off work to pick me up to go to an appointment? Um, it's all of those things that make you worry and anxious. Um, and it makes it hard to just go about your day. Not being able to translate playing at The Ohio State University in late November uh, when it's, you know, 30, 40 degrees outside and you not understanding why your body is not able to perform in its capacity. It's, oh, it's just because you're from Florida, so you're used to the heat and uh, it, it'll, it'll be okay. But to know that this was a real life condition that I was uneducated about uh, has definitely uh, affected you know, my, my perception of, of life uh, uh, at this point. Um, and I think for, particularly for sickle cell disease, that lack of ability to plan for the future, that and that um, finality of this is my life expectancy. So it's very interesting. I had a conversation with actually an oncology patient during my fellowship, and we were talking about prognosis. Um, and she said, "Are you putting, are you putting a toe tag on me? Are you, are you?" And I said, 
I'm sorry, what? And she, and she goes, yeah, it sounds to me like you're putting a toe tag on me. Like when you go to the morgue, you're giving me, this is where I'm going to live till. Well, you probably won't live until, you, you probably live till you get 25. I said, no, mm -mm, that's not me. I don't plan on dying at 25. So you got to have the will, too. None of us know what tomorrow will bring, sickle cell or not. And so to say to patients, I don't anticipate you'll live past 40, I think is doing them a great disservice because everything then in their mind is framed from that point. Growing up, the prognosis for sickle cell was much more optimistic than it had been in the past. And nobody ever directly said, you'll probably make it this far. But what I did get and understand even as a kid was when people say, oh, don't worry, we have sickle cell patients living till 60. And that kind of establishes a date in your head. Okay, so I guess I live till 60. Um, and I guess, especially growing up, I didn't realize that that was a different way to look at things. Um, you see people talking about, oh, so-and-so died so young at the age of 52, and I'm like, no, that's about right. And it just messes with your head in ways like that. I know I struggle specifically with setting expectations for my future, and on really, really tough days, when you kind of get to that point of, what am I even doing? What, why, why do I bother? It's because you have that expectation in your mind that like, why go to school for so long just so that you can get a job to pay into retirement when you're probably not gonna live to retirement? Like it's those thoughts that make it hard. It's those expectations of, well, you'll be lucky to make it to 60. I like how, like, I like a saying that says, let your speech be seasoned with salt, like with grace. Like, and I think sometimes because we're so uh, data-driven and so analytical and our approach is, is, is the same way, um, we tend to treat people more like commodities than like people. The missions and the goals of the Third and Long Foundation are to support families, to support families that are dealing with sickle cell disease and raise more awareness for uh, uh, support. Knowing that my son has to miss school. I'm not at jeopardy of losing my job because I have enough funds to take care of my son, medical expenses while he's in the hospital, but still be of great assistance. But there are many other families out there that can't do that. Moms and dads are losing their jobs because they can't work for a week at a time. And this is happening every month for six years. That the, 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 the owner says he's had enough. And now the cable is turned off. The lights are next. There's no food in the refrigerator. What are we doing to support these families with this condition that can't fight that system, that can't fight back for what they're dealing with? This is what the Third and Long Foundation is built for, to support those families who are in need. The first thing would be to just travel anywhere, like without having to worry about a nearest hospital. Like that would be great if I could just pick up one day and just go, like go to an airport and just fly somewhere without worrying about medical complications. That sounds amazing. Just like to just once, just like pick a random trip and go somewhere. That would be so cool. <laughs>